Hello, welcome to the Show Up Dad. This is a podcast for hardworking fathers looking to level up their fathering skills and be more than just a paycheck or provider for the home. Today, we welcome Melinda Wenner Moyer. Melinda is a journalist who covers parenting, science, and medicine. As an award winning science journalist, Melinda was regularly asked to investigate and address all kinds of parenting questions from how to potty train, how to get vaccines, and how to help kids sleep through the night. But as Melinda's children grew, she found that one huge area was ignored in the realm of parenting advice. And that's our topic today. How do we make sure our kids don't grow up to be assholes? Melinda, thank you for coming on the show. And I just want to encourage you to just give our listeners a background and how you came up with that realization that you had. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, that's a good question. So I have been writing a parenting column for many years and I I the way I go about it is I try to answer parenting questions with science because my background is in science and so there are just you know there's so many questions we have as parents and they can be so hard to answer so what I would do is is say hey I wonder if there's any research on this in you know the um in the field of child development or I wonder if there's any research on this in the field of parenting and So I've always enjoyed doing that. And then recently in the past few years, I started wanting to answer more questions about shaping character in kids and shaping values in kids, because I found there weren't a lot of great answers to those questions. Like, how do you, what what can we do to raise kind kids and compassionate kids? And and what is, you know, is there research on this? And it turns out there's actually a ton of research on this. And I felt like it was just really important. I was seeing, you know, there's so much disagreement and anger in the world. And I was, I was seeing that and feeling that and thinking, you know, what can I do as a parent to really instill in my kids the values that I want to see? And, and I realized too, that parents have a lot of power in that regard mm-hmm. because we're, you know, we're raising the next generation of yes. Americans, right? And so we have a lot of say in what that next generation looks like by how we parent them. So it just felt really pressing and important right now. And so I, I started digging into the research and writing about it. Yeah. And, and what you said there too, Melinda, it's, it's so true as parents, you know, as, as fathers, as mothers and stuff like that, we have so much sway over our children. We actually really are just role models for them whether it be as a father, you know, role modeling to his daughter, how, you know, the, the type of man she should be looking for, or, a, or a father treating the mother in a certain way. And it just conveys a message, you know, to the sons and the daughters and how they should treat their spouse or significant other. Now, Melinda, with that being said, I want to ask you, how do you think social media is conveying the wrong message to our children? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I um, Social media is definitely a mixed bag. I've looked at what the research says on how kids are affected by social media. And it, in a way, it really depends on what they're doing on social mm-hmm. media, what they're seeing. I mean, there's so much different content and there's so much different things people can be, kids can be doing online. And the research, because I always, I'm always going to go back to the research. <laughs> the research is pretty actually unclear overall on sort of the effects of screens on kids and social media on kids. It's kind of all over the place, but but we know that especially with older kids, when they're sort of passing passively scrolling through Instagram or Snapchat and seeing what other people are doing, that's not always constructive because they'll often see their friends doing things that you know they weren't involved in or that they go into comparison mode and they're like what why does it look like this person has more friends than i do and why did this kid get to do this thing i didn't get to do and, and that that can contribute to um sadness and just a sense of despondence sometimes in kids but at the same time sharing on social media the research suggests can be really great for kids and make them feel you know, empowered and like, and creative, if, especially if they're, they're sharing things that they've made or that they're interested in. Um, so, so it's a hard question to answer because it really kind of depends on what kids are doing. It depends on the kid as well. Um, but I wouldn't say that social media is just a terrible force for kids all around. I think it, it really depends. 
Yeah, I, I think it depends. And as, as, as parents, we are the gatekeepers, you know what I mean? Obviously, you want to be engaged and committed with your children to help them, you know, be careful with these predators. I mean, we've had episodes on here of talking about sexual predators and stuff like that. And then I also had another guest talking about how we are the, we're raising the first digital natives, you know, and that teens consume nine hours of media daily on average. You know what I mean? It is a, it is a lot. Yes, it is a lot. Um, but I, just to add on to something you just said, mm -hmm. one, I have a chapter in my upcoming book on on managing screens and social media with kids. And one of the big take homes that that I have is that it's much better to be a mentor for kids when they're when you're dealing with media. So there's different ways you can look at it. You could be like a um, you could be a limiter. You, you could think of your role as somebody who controls the media and prevents your kids from from having access to it. But that doesn't work that well, because even if you don't let your kids use screens at home, they will go to friends' houses and have access. They will, they're going to end up having access to media. So it's really better to engage with kids about the media that they're consuming and really try to mentor them and, and you know, research the apps they want with them and talk and talk with them about them and, and participate with them in as much. I mean, obviously we can't all the time and um, and our kids are going to be, you know, using media when we're not there. But to the degree that we can actually interact with them, talk to them about what they're doing, um, what kinds of apps they're using, and and really just be there with them, mm -hmm. um, and even use media with them, play video games with them. That can be really constructive and really fun at family time. We we got a Nintendo Switch for Christmas. Um, oh, awesome! For the kids, or I shall I say, it's Santa got them one, <laughs> and it's actually been super fun. We've been doing family games on the weekends we've been doing just dance 2021 and making fools of ourselves in, in our basement but it really feels like a family activity even though it involves a screen and it kind of brings us together it's fun no absolutely and every single chance you get a chance to be able to engage with your children as a family like that that's just so productive in their lives um especially now with these winter storms i don't know how your weather is out there i mean but i mean right now kids can't really go outside. You know what I mean? It's yeah bad. So these are perfect opportunities to be able to use your Nintendo switch or board games or whatever you see fit to, to really just engage your children into your family. And that's, that's awesome. Absolutely. Yep. Now, Melinda, I wanted to ask you, how do we raise children who are kind, considerate and ethical inside and outside the home? What's your take that's on that? A, <laughs> that's a great question. So that's a big question too. And I think there's a lot of different ways that we can do this, but you already actually touched on a really big one, which is a big theme in my book, which mm -hmm. is modeling the behavior that we want to see. And mo so kids really look to us and watch us and study what we do to, to understand you know, what they should be doing in the world. And so the more that we can be kind, even if, you know, during this pandemic, we're not seeing a lot of people, but kind to each other. So it's, it's hard. We're all stuck in the same house and we're not all going to get along. I know, but I try, especially in front of my kids to be as respectful as I can to my husband and to engage with him in a respectful and kind way, because I know my kids are watching us for mm -hmm. clues on, you know, how they should be treating other people. So modeling the behavior and, and the values that you want to see is really important. And that, and that can also just that can be conversations that you're having with your kids about other people in their lives saying, gosh, you know, I'm worried. I'm thinking a lot about grandma and I, and I wonder how she's doing because she doesn't get to see her friends. Maybe, maybe we should send a care package. What do you think? And, and, and thinking through aloud with our kids, the things that we can be doing as a family and they can be thinking about and doing that are generous and that are kind. That's one, that's one big thing um, mm -hmm. that could be really helpful. There's a lot. One thing that I think might be surprising that I found when I dug into the research on kindness in particular, kindness and generosity, and what, what do we know about how to engage with kids to make them kinder people? One of the really big things is, and this, again, doesn't seem like it, it would make sense at first, but it's talking to kids about feelings a lot. And this can be hard and it might even be especially hard for fathers. I don't, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I, I love talking about feelings, so it's not hard for me that much, but 
What the research suggests is that the more we talk to our kids about feelings, the more the better they get at being able to perceive other people's feelings and other people's needs. And this builds a skill that's called theory of mind, which is basically mm -hmm. like being able to take the perspective of other people and understand what they're going through and sort of figure out what they need. And the more that kids can do that, the more they can help other people. And they, they think of, oh, you know, it seems like this person is sad and, and let me do something supportive to help them. So mm -hmm. just by talking about your own feelings as a parent or talking about your kids' feelings, saying, you know, even like acknowledging and naming feelings like, oh, you're, you seem really frustrated right now. You know, what's going on? Are you frustrated? How do you feel? Having these conversations, which seem kind of trivial about feelings can really make a difference. And I can, if you want, describe a kind of a crazy study that was done once that illustrates this, which I thought was just like fascinating. Um, so it was, this, okay. So there were researchers who invited a bunch of moms and I was actually really mad there's so much research out there that only includes moms and we can talk about that, but that is not fair and it should not be that way. And more research should have dads involved. Yes. Um, but um, researchers invited moms and their kids. I think these were toddlers into a lab and had the moms read books to the toddlers and they recorded the moms as they read books and they paid attention to how much the, the moms would pause and talk about the characters feelings in the books or talk about their kids feeling as they read the kids feelings as they read the book so they would you know they would see how many times the mom said hey how do you think this bear is feeling right now in this book or whatnot um mm -hmm. and then after that they asked the they invited the kids into a room with a researcher and they played with the kid and the researcher kind of pretended that she needed help or he needed help um like the researcher would say i'm really cold i wish i had that blanket over there but i can't reach it and what they found was that the, the kids whose moms talked about feelings a lot when reading the books, which they presumed these moms talk about feelings in general a lot with those kids, mm -hmm. those kids, when they were in the lab with the researchers, they were much more likely to help the researchers when they needed help. They were much more likely to go get that blanket and give it to the researcher or pick up a pen that the researcher had dropped. They were just much more generous and helpful. And that kind of illustrates this link between talking about feelings and then the kids actually being more compassionate and more helpful and more generous. So it's, it's really interesting. That That's is, a that, yes, absolutely. That is very interesting. Um, what I always try to convey to my children is put yourself in another person's shoes. Okay. And right. even as fathers or mothers, you know, I try to put my kid, myself, in their shoes, what they're feeling at that moment, at that time, you know what I mean? And what that does is it develops a sensitivity to their needs and you're able to better address the issues that concern them. And I've seen a major, major uh, breakthrough in my, my teenage daughter. Okay. Um, she's 14 years old, you know, obviously she's going through changes in her life, physical and, and you know, mental and stuff like that, you know, as she gets older. And uh, with that being said, me not being present in her earlier life because of me being on the road and, and, and providing for my family and stuff like that. It's hard for me to communicate with her sometimes because she's not used to that. So now just putting myself in her shoes, like we talked about and seeing, you know, why she's feeling like that and stuff like that. And I'm able to, to reach her on, on another level and it really works. So, I mean, you're spot on with that, you know? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's great to hear that that really works for you too. Um, yeah, that perspective taking is really important and really helpful for kids. Melinda, I want to ask you, what are some of the traits we want our children to possess? What are traits that you think? Yeah, that's a great question. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that because in writing my book, which is how to raise kids who aren't assholes, I thought, mm -hmm. okay, so what makes an asshole and, and what's the opposite of that, right? So I really kind of sat down and thought about what are those traits that, that I thought anyway, and everybody might have different opinions, um, mm -hmm. but I tried to distill down what I thought it was. So, and, and I can kind of go through what I end up addressing in the book. Um, I mean, the first one is um, is kindness and generosity, which we've already kind of touched upon. Like, how do you um, th that just seems you know compassion and and 
thinking about other people. That seems to be a, a trait that I really that I really want my kids to have. Um, and then another one I thought of was, okay, I don't want my kids to be really lazy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's not really, it's not really assholishness or if that's a word, assholery, but it's related. So I thought about, okay, well, what can I do to, to, to raise kids who are resilient and motivated and who really, you know, have sort of a passion for life and learning? Um, that seemed like an important thing. So I, I talked a bit about that. Um, bullying, of course, like that's related to kindness, but I wanted to specifically address what are we, you know, what do we know about how to raise kids who don't bully and, and why do kids bully and how does this happen? Um, mm -hmm. And what should we be aware of? So I talked about that. Um, lying and swearing <laughs> is another one. Honesty seems like a very important trait that we want our kids to have. Obviously kids do tell lies and that's totally normal. Mm -hmm. And also kids will swear and that's totally normal. And those aren't signs that kids are terrible or anything. But, um, but I did want to understand, you know, what can we do as parents to foster honesty when, when it matters for kids. Mm -hmm. um, then I also was really interested in um, the issue of like gender stereotypes and how do we raise our kids to not basically be sexist? Um, what do we know about how that develops? Um, mm -hmm. And another thing, um, uh, trait that I know a lot of us think about is self-esteem. Like how do we, how do we encourage healthy self-esteem? And that's an interesting area as well in terms of what the research says. Um, and then I, sorry, okay. I feel like I'm jumping around, but I'm just sort of going through my book as I address things. And then um, racism is another one I wanted, to, like, how do I raise my kids to be not racist? And what are the mm -hmm. ways in which we can foster that? And those are really hard, especially for, especially for white parents who, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I was raised in a house where we didn't talk about race. It was like a very taboo subject. And so it was very interesting to dig into the research on that. Um, so those are, I mean, I don't know if you call those traits or not, but those are things that I thought of at, when I thought of, okay, what do I hope for my kids? What do I want them? What kinds of people do I want them to be there? People, they were you know, people who treated other people with respect and, you know, had healthy self-esteem and were passionate about life and happy. I mean, happiness also, I, I want my kids to be happy too. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the big ones hmm. yeah, that, no, I, that the, I thought of. No, those are, those are really awesome points that you hit on there. Um, back to happiness. I had a guest on here who talked about that as parents, it's not our jobs to make our children happy, he said, but it is our jobs to provide the atmosphere for them to experience happiness. Do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. I do. And, and I think too, um, from what I've seen in the research, there are links between all these things. So kids who are kinder and more generous are also happier. They tend to be, there've been really interesting studies that have found that when kids kids are happier when they're giving away things sometimes than when they're getting things. Mm -hmm. And so by fostering, you know, this sense of, of, um, or by stressing like the importance of kindness and, and, and being good to others, we can actually make our kids happier too. And I think that's really interesting because it's, that's another one that's not maybe intuitive. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's what the research suggests, but I, but I absolutely agree with what, the, what your, um, your source or the person you interviewed said about it's not our job to make kids happy and and in that regard too especially mm -hmm. now during this pandemic I feel like it's important to say it's okay for kids to be sad too and it's it's not our jobs to fix that it's it's our jobs to support kids when they're mm -hmm. sad and help them manage their emotions and help them find coping strategies but we're not there to fix it and we can't fix it either Hmm. Yeah, as, as parents, I think, well, especially as fathers, okay, this is my point of view, we tend to, as men, we tend to want to solve everything. Mm -hmm. And then we get frustrated when we can't. So that that frustration comes out and the kids could feel it. And then thus you're creating a toxic environment for your children, you know, and That's it's kind of kind of a vicious circle, you know? Absolutely. It's really interesting that you bring that up. I was just doing a bunch of interviews with um, adolescent psychologists like and, and school counselors mm -hmm. who were all basically saying this, uh, that especially with older kids, when they have a problem and they come to us, they often just wanna talk, they wanna vent, they wanna tell us what's going on, but 
our instinct is to immediately jump in with solutions and, oh, you should be doing this. Oh, why, why didn't you try this? You should try this. And that, yeah, exactly what you said, that can turn them off. And they're like, why did I even tell you this? I didn't want a solution. I just wanted to be listened to. And so it can be, it can be really hard, but yes, to the degree that we can sort of realize that what they need most sometimes is just to be heard. Mm -hmm. That can be really helpful for them, but it's hard. Oh yeah, it definitely, especially <laughs> when, you know, and then obviously parenting for a son and a daughter are completely different. So with my sons, I got to lay down the rules. I got to, I got to have structure for them before they will want any kind of relationship with me. They got to know that, Hey, pick this up, do this, do this, you know, um, we're going to, they got to be lined out is what I call it. Now, if I try that same approach with my daughter, it doesn't even work. I mean, <laughs> she has to absolutely know that I care that I, I, I want to know how she's feeling, you know, and it, it's, it's amazing the different levels, you know, like boys want to be respected, you know, and daughters want to be loved. And it goes back to even marriage, right? The deepest need for a man is respect. When he's not feeling that respect, he's not going to want to show the love that a woman's deepest need is. She needs to feel love secured by this man, right? And it, it's, it's, a, it's called a crazy cycle. And uh, Dr. Um, Egerin, Egrix, I believe his name is, he, he spoke on love and respect and the crazy cycle and getting on that. And it, it holds true even to your daughters is what I'm trying to get my point across. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting that I'm able to implement that into not only my marriage, but into my children as well. You know what I mean? Just the love and the respect thing, you know? So mm -hmm. it's pretty, pretty awesome. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Great book, yeah. by the way, too. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Uh, I wanted to ask you through your research, how important is a father in the development of a child? Have you, have you found that? be really relevant? Yeah. You know, this just going back to what I was saying, I was frustrated about a minute ago. Mm -hmm. There has not been enough research on dads. There needs to be more. And it's, <laughs> it's really frustrating because um, yeah, a lot of studies that I've looked at mm -hmm. have focused on mothers and the, and the influence of mothers. There are some, of course, on dads and yes, they point to dads being immensely important. I, I feel like there, there is no difference in how important parents are. I think our culture has, has made it such that women are doing more child rearing, um, but that's not necessarily a reflection of how it should be or how, or how important, you know, how relatively important the different parents are. I think dads are just as important as moms. And it's really interesting because I knew I was going to be talking with you on the podcast. I did do a little research on what we know about dads. And, and it's interesting because there's, I think they're equally important, but dads and moms sometimes have different roles and they play yes. different roles. Right. And one of the big things um, is, is dads are more playful often with their kids and they encourage their kids to take risks, mm -hmm. which is certainly true in my <laughs> family. I am the much more concerned, like much more anxious and careful and nurture, like nurturing parent. And my husband is like, oh, you know, taking them sledding and throwing them around and roughhousing and doing all the sort of playful things and pushing them more, like challenging them more and, and pushing them to take more risks, which is really, I think, very important um, mm -hmm. that, and that role that dads play is extremely important. There's also some really interesting research suggesting that dads are uniquely important for language development. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was really interesting. So dads talk to kids differently than moms do sometimes, and but in ways that really relate to how much um, like how their vo vocabulary grows in kids and, um, and, you know, how, just how, like what they learn language wise, it's very, very important. And I thought that was really interesting too. Mm -hmm. um, and a little surprising. I mean, I, I definitely feel like I have different conversations with my kids than my husband does. So it's maybe not that surprising, but, um, but yes, there are areas where in, like some relative areas where dads are more important than moms um, mm -hmm. and do different things. But I would say like, yeah, but there's, if anybody tells dads that they're not as important as moms, I think that's BS. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, 
one of the things I, I saw, you know, and I, I've been doing a lot of research on this and, you know, you touch base on it a little bit is uh, how society has deemed fathers not important anymore, right? Um, mm-hmm. And you see that even with the television media and stuff like that, when they portray a father, they, they portray this bumbling idiot, for lack of better words, like, a, like Homer Simpson, right? You know, right. this guy who's totally clueless and everything like that. So in a sense, society has kind of dumbed down our roles, you know, and I think that's, that's a major no, no. And that's that I think right there is where we're at in society in general, because a long time ago, before the industrial revolution and stuff like that, fathers at a certain point of age, right, would get their children and they would take them with them to work. Oh, and it was a apprenticeship type deal. So the father would take him. He would not only learn the family business and stuff like that, but he would learn life skills. He would be engaged with his father. He was learning his identity through his father, right? Mm-hmm. Now, with that being said, industrial revolution came in. Fathers had to leave, you know, leave the house, go work in factories or, or do whatever they needed to do to provide for their families. Now, the mother would have to take over that role that the father was doing. Okay, so it put this unhealthy amount of of weight on her shoulders. Okay, so mother started to become stressed out, you know, taking care of this, taking care of that, you know, and I even did some research where it talked about how a lot of mothers when they take on that role as this uh, homekeeper with, with the father being gone for a long time. They develop a PCOS, they develop all kinds of different issues with hormones, and they even start growing like hair on their face and stuff like that. And, and their testosterone levels start elevating. Okay. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting and in how critical our role as a father is in the lives of our, not only our children, but our, our families as well, you know, and uh, Absolutely. I mean, it's pretty astounding, you know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that is very interesting. So it's just kind of recent culture that tells us that dads aren't as important. And that's really interesting. It's all, it's all sort of cultural and Mm -hmm. it's, but it doesn't reflect, it doesn't reflect anything, you know, innate or anything that that's like a, yeah, biology or anything Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. And then you even have like people talking about toxic masculinity and all these different things. I really don't want to get into right now, but (laughs) you know what I mean? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But uh, now back to our our subject at hand. Um, I wanted to ask you about your father and how was he an influence in your life? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, My, uh, my dad was um, he worked a lot. And Mm -hmm. he was not at home a lot. He traveled. He had a job that that he traveled for. Um, And it's interesting because I, you know, I realize now the time I spent with my dad was certainly much less than what I spent with my mom, but he had such an immense influence on me and who I became and what I considered important. Um, And so it's kind of fascinating that even though I, I mean, and my mom did too, of course, but you know, even though I didn't get to spend as much time with my dad, it doesn't mean that he meant less or he shaped my life any less, I feel like, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he, and, and I think, you know, he loved his job and I am fortunate to have a job that I love. And that's a career that I find, you know, just, I just love and, and, and I find very fulfilling. And so in some ways too, his dedication to his job I think also kind of affected me and, and made me want to find a career that, that I found fulfilling. Um, so, I mean, he, he had very high expectations of me. I remember that growing up and that was something that like very much stuck with me. And he sort of expected that I would, would be a certain type of person or do, you know, just really work hard in school, stuff like that. And I think mm-hmm. having those expectations there made me sort of naturally want to want to reach them. Like, even though he wasn't around as much, it was, mm-hmm. it was still like a very profound, um, strong uh, expectation that he had of me. And so, 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to think back. And I know there was part of me that was really sad that he wasn't around more too. But um, but I don't remember that sadness so much as a grown up. I kind of like remember the times we we did have together and all the fun things we did because when he was mm -hmm. home, we certainly had a lot of fun. Hmm. That's yeah. that's that's awesome to see your reflection on your father and just to see even you know he had limited time with you, the good times and the bad times. And to see how much influence he had in your life, even though he was out working, he influenced right. you to be able to find a job that you felt fulfilled in. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And sometimes he took me with him to his work. And I also, just because you were just talking about that, the industrial revolution before the industrial revolution, I loved that. Like I loved going to get to see where he worked and what he did and meet his coworkers. I thought it was so fun and just it's a whole different world. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I know that's not always possible for dads to do, but, um, but I, but I imagine kids really enjoy that. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, even in my trade, when I worked at the utility, we used to have a children's day, right? And they would invite all the fathers into school. I don't know if they still do that, you know, especially with COVID and everything like that, but they would invite the fathers into school and you'd get up there and you'd be like, Hey, my name's so-and-so I'm the father of so-and-so, and this is what I do. You know what I mean? And uh, I remember one time we actually had a arc demonstration where we would bring in a transformer that was live and we would actually you know break a load and mess around with electricity so the children could see in, in a wow. controlled environment and i just remember my my daughter just being so amazed with her daddy you know what i mean that oh that's yeah. my daddy he's a lineman he, he controls electricity and all that stuff you know what i mean so that that definitely is something i think if they're not doing it they need to bring it back you know what i mean yeah absolutely yeah, I mean, it, it makes you as a kid realize that your dad or your mom isn't just dad or mom, right? They have this whole other sort of life in the in the world where they're doing things that really matter. And and I think that's really eye-opening because as a kid, sometimes you forget that. You just think, oh, they're just mom, they're just dad, and that's mm -hmm. all they are. <laughs> but they're not, right? There's so much more. Um, and it's really neat when we can help our kids see that. Absolutely. And, you know, and they start realizing that, hey, dad's just not a, a provider or a paycheck. You know, he's actually, Absolutely. you know, a really cool dude who's who's contributing <laughs> to society or whatever. You know what I mean? Or, and mom, right. you know what I mean? Mom's this, you know, courageous woman who's just really just helping us out, you know? So it's yeah. pretty awesome. What other life lessons did your dad teach you that you could remember if you could share with our audience? Yeah. Um, he is, he always was very good at thinking through things in ways that didn't come naturally to me at first, but really sitting down and, and like before making an important decision, just thinking as rationally, he's an incredible, incredibly rational person. Mm -hmm. um, so to him, like, and, and that's probably why I do what I do, because he was all about evidence and data and, um, and thinking through things in sort of an impartial way. And that certainly stuck with me. And I, I mean, it, to be honest, it, I pushed against it a lot because I also am kind of a intuitive person and I listen, and I don't always have reasons I can list out but uh, for doing things. But I also, but I do think that that was something that he has helped instill in me is this way of thinking through things and being a little more, um, thoughtful about things than I might otherwise be inclined to be. Mm -hmm. um, and he, as I said, like having, he always had high expectations. And I think um, that made a big difference in my life. I don't know that that's necessarily um, a life lesson though. That's not a life lesson. Mm -hmm. um, but I think following, following my dreams too, he's always been, he was always very supportive of whatever I was really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes those things changed rapidly when I was a kid, mm -hmm. but he was always so excited about them. And I think um, that also was just very um, profound for me to have support in whatever I was interested in, even if it was something he didn't really care about. Um, and certainly I had interests that he was like, why are you so, I mean, I used to, uh, yeah, I used to be a love to play the piano and I used to love to write short stories. And those were things that he didn't know a lot about, but he was always very um, very supportive of, and I appreciated that and noticed it. So, um, so there's probably a life lesson in there about mm -hmm. sort of following your kids, um, 
passion and at least like supporting what they're passionate about, even if it's not something you really get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that was really meaningful. I, I think as parents, we're, that's part of our job. Okay. It's part of our job to help our children develop these skills. Okay. They're, they're gifts for lack of better words, right? They got these gifts inside of them. And as parents, our job is to help them develop those gifts and to kind of influence their, their life in a positive way. You know what I mean? Okay. To try to get them to say, okay, well, this is a gift you have. Let's, you know, you know, what if you try this or whatever, and just be with them to just encourage them, you know, like prime example, my daughter, she's wanted to be a horse trainer. She, she wanted to do all different kinds of stuff. And I'm like, okay, you can do that. You know what I mean? It's going to take hard work and it's going to take study, but you can do that. You know what I mean? Your gifts line up according to this, you know, cause she's compassionate about animals and stuff like that, you know, and it kind of changed over the course of time to where now she wants to be a veterinarian, which is really cool. And I, I encourage her to do that. You know what I mean? But if she was to tell me from here to tomorrow, dad, I want to be a, a welder or something like that. I'd be like, right on. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> So it's, it's pretty awesome to see that your father did that with you, you know, and he was just there to, to really encourage you in, in you know, in the way of your development and stuff like that. Yeah, I, wanted, absolutely. I, I wanted to ask you, what do you see as part of fathers? What mistakes do fathers make that you've seen? This is a hard one because uh, I don't want to overgeneralize, you know, everybody's different. <laughs> um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, one thing that I having read so much recently about parenting and about um, kids mm -hmm. and something that I know I've sometimes has been an issue in with sort of talking to my husband about and, and helping him understand. My kids are younger, they're six and nine. Um, and I find that my kids often, will act out in ways that you could interpret as they're just kind of trying to be obnoxious. They're just being obnoxious for the sake of being obnoxious. And, uh, and, and that's what I, what I've learned recently is that that's not necessarily, that's often not the case. The kids often act out or do things that we find obnoxious or rude or impolite or whatnot, because they really just don't have the skills to behave differently right then in that moment. And so like, I'm trying to think, there was an example I remember last night at dinner where my six-year-old was just not sitting at the kitchen table and eating dinner in a proper way. Like she was just kind of being obnoxious. And, um, and I know, I know she was tired. She'd woken up super early the night before or the morning before, and she was really just having trouble with dinner. And the, at first I was like, why are you being like this? Why you're doing this on purpose? Like you're trying to ruin dinner or you're just, why are you being obnoxious? You can be better than this. And then I, I realized, oh, well, she's just really struggling right now. She's really tired. She doesn't have the skills to, to, to manage this right now. And that's why she's acting out. It's not, it's not that she's um, you know, purposefully doing this. And, and I have talked to a lot of friends of mine who say well, that, that they struggle with this with their husband sometimes where there's their husbands sometimes interpret their kids behavior as sort of intentionally um mm -hmm. uh just they they're they're trying to be jerks or they're just they're it's under their control and they could not do it if they wanted to not do it mm -hmm. and what i've been learning recently i just finished a really great book it's really old book called the explosive child um i think it's by ross green and it was incredible how Dr. Green has been around a long time. I think he was, well, <laughs> he's been a child psychologist for a long, long time. He, I think was at Massachusetts General Hospital for a long time. And he came up with this framework of basically understanding kids behavior, challenging behavior as a reflection of skills that they still don't have and need to work on. And it really isn't that they're just being jerks. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and it may seem like it, but there's a lot more underneath and that we kind of need to keep in mind. And mm -hmm. so I think, I don't know if I explained that very well, but I think sometimes the more that we can just 
try to empathize with our kids and again see things from their perspective mm -hmm. um and not from our perspective of well, why can't you act normal at dinner yes that's what an adult could do an adult can you know we have all the skills to be able to even if we're in a bad mood you know be somewhat mm -hmm. decent at dinner and not yell at other people but our kids don't have those skills and they have a, like their brains are so underdeveloped they don't have the ability to plan and to hold back their feelings in ways that we do i mean we can kind of grin you know grit our teeth and get through a moment without exploding our kids just cannot do that and they just explode and so i think the more that we can try to remember that that they really just often are acting the way they are because they don't have the skills they need to to act better that can mm. that can really help and that can help in terms of making it easier for us as parents to deal with those moments um just having a little bit of compassion so that's something mm -hmm. i don't know if that's helpful um and i guess just like being proactive is great as a dad i would encourage dads to be sort of as proactive and in getting involved in their kids lives as they can be and and offering support to their wives in ways that maybe they didn't think of can be helpful like i don't know offering to take the kids to the doctor instead or yeah just little yeah. things that often the moms end up having that bearing a lot of the sort of have you heard like mental load of, mm -hmm. of parenting where we're like oh yeah we're we keep track of when the kids need to go to the dentist and the doctor and which clothes they need for school and what they you know which homework they haven't done yet and all of those things that that I'll can up, end yeah. up overcome you know, overwhelming us the more mm -hmm. that dads can try to take that on even if we're not always good at asking for help i feel like um mm -hmm. but we, ex we we want it so the more that dads can actually offer it the that's also very, very helpful. That's awesome to see your perspective from this point of view, because, you know, we our, our show centers around fathers and fathers being more engaged and stuff. And it's, it's awesome to have a mother, a woman come on here and talk about, you know, what fathers need to do that, that would help you guys out. Cause right. I think it gets lost in translation, especially with communication. I think a lot of issues would be solved with better communication. Okay. Absolutely. Um, to touch base on what you're talking about. One of the clinical psychologists that I had on our show talked about how kids, if you're engaged as a father, if you're engaged with your children, you're going to see these silent cries. Okay. You're going to see that they're acting out because like you touched base on, they have a need. They don't know how to convey this message to you. So they act out in ways. And when you're not giving them the attention they need, as a child or as, as a young adult, they're going to get your attention one way or another, whether it be a call at two o'clock in the morning, in the, in the, in the morning, you know, saying, Hey, your kid's drunk driving. Right. Or, you know, them doing something really awesome and, and finding the cure of cancer or something like that. You know what I mean? They're going to get your attention. So <laughs> you got to be engaged with your children, you know, and, that level of engagement comes with also trust. You know, they got to be able to trust you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that's a very good point too. Yep. Now, speaking on conveying messages, um, how do we convey a message that's not confusing to our children? Do you believe that we need to be consistent with what we say? I think that's to the degree that you can be consistent. Yes, it's very helpful. But it's hard. It's really hard. And I think it's really hard, especially when you have two parents who might have different perceptions and 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 different ways of seeing a situation. And we're not always going to respond in sync, right? We're not always going to deal with a situation the same way. Mm -hmm. And and so I mean, I think consistency is helpful. And and that again comes down to communicating with your partner about how you how you want to approach different kinds of situations and just having conversations. But at the same time, if you're not entirely consistent with one another, um, kids can kind of, it, it, it's okay, you know, if you're mm -hmm. not completely consistent. And sometimes there's, kids know that their parents have slightly different styles and and, and they kind of complement each other in some way. Um, so it's it's a hard question because I, I, think, I think consistency is great, but I just don't know that it's always realistic. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way that we can entirely be in sync with our partners all the time about how we're going to respond to things and how we're going to react to things. Um, and, you know, sometimes I also think that when we're not consistent or we handle a situation in which maybe doesn't align with our values or the ways that we wanted to mm -hmm. deal with the situation, 
that can actually be a positive thing too, because we can go back, we can revisit it, we can apologize to our kids. So I'm thinking of like times when your kids catch you and you're just super stressed out or you just can't deal and you explode or you yell at them and you handle the situation in a way that you just wish, you know, you wish you could have handled it better. Mm -hmm. um, and those are mistakes. I mean, those are things every, every parent has experienced. We've all oh, yeah. <laughs> mishandled situations with our kids, but sometimes that's, that's an opportunity to go back re with our kids and say, Hey, I didn't handle that very well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry. And, you know, I, I really should think of ways to manage my anger better. And, and you can even like problem solve with your kids then like, what, what do you think, what could I have done better in that situation? Or mm -hmm. you can help like, in, use them in a way and, and engage with them in ways to turn it into a learning experience. Um, so, so I guess that what I'm trying to say is that when we aren't consistent or when we do handle things in ways that, that aren't exactly what, how we wanted to, that's okay. And we can sort of turn it into a positive moment as well. And I've certainly had a lot of those moments mm. this year where, where <laughs> um, the pandemic, where I'm just so stretched so thin and my kids ask me the wrong question at the wrong time. And I'm like, I can't help you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I always try to go back and, and, and revisit it again and apologize. I mean, sometimes just showing our kids that we also apologize and that it's important for us to apologize. That, that sends a message to them too. Again, about modeling the behavior you want to see, mm -hmm. um, owning up to mistakes and stuff. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And it, like I said, it's it's awesome to see your perspective from a woman's point of view. Um, what I always try to tell fathers is that level has prevail. In parenting, level heads always mm -hmm. prevail, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, to kind of touch base on the different um, ways we parent from a father to a, a, a wife, right? A, a, you know, a mother. I read this book called Men Are like waffles and women are like, like spaghetti and it made total sense to me. I don't know if you've read that book, but uh, no. okay. So the concept of this and, and it works even with my daughter, just trying to, to learn about her and you know, the way she thinks, right. Cause sometimes men we're like, what the heck are you talking about? What do you think? You know, like what's going on in your brain. Right. And then we get into these arguments. Okay. So the concept of it is men, we have boxes just like a waffle. Okay. And when we're in those boxes, that's where we're at, you know, and when we're say, for instance, work mode box, we're in that box. We're totally focused on work. We don't want to be distracted or anything like that. Cause that's how men function. Okay. When we start jumping from box to box, it totally freaks us out. I mean, totally freaks us out. So then we get annoyed or, for lack of better words, we start acting out because we don't know how to handle this box jumping. Mm -hmm. Now, women are like spaghetti. Every single thought touches another thought. So when you're telling us these stories, and I'll use my daughter as an example, she'll talk about fish. She'll be talking about fish. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, all right, we'll get to the point, you know, because as men, we want to solve the problem. Okay. And then she'll shut down because she's like, dad's not listening to me. Okay. And that even works for our spouses. So if we sit there and listen, we'll see that they're going to get the point, but each point touches a piece of that spaghetti and it's all in tied to, to what she's trying to convey her message about, you know what I mean? Whether mm -hmm. it be she'd be talking with her friends or what happened or this, this happened, this, whatever, you know, I went shopping or whatever. And then all of a sudden she gets to her point. Oh, by the way, I'm really tired. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And, and men were like, all right, well, what's your issue? You know what I mean? So it's, it's a great book. Um, men are, mm -hmm. men are like spaghetti or men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti. And it's really helped me tremendously just to be able to deal, you know, with my wife and with a child that's a, a female, you know what I mean? So mm, that's it's, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's great stuff. I mean, it's, it's awesome to be able to utilize all these tools to, to, to become self-aware and, and, you know, better understand your significant other or your children. So, right. Right. Pr That's pretty great. awesome. I wanted to ask you when it comes to parenting, being that we have all different kinds of styles and stuff like that, how have you helped your father with the scientific research or not your father, your husband, sorry, with scientific research, you know, how, do, how does that, 
how does that dynamic work in your household, knowing that you do a lot of study <laughs> and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, my husband also has a science background, but it's more like physical sciences, um, mm -hmm. but he loves science. So that helps. Um, but what I will often do, yeah, I will sometimes find that we will be in a situation and I will like a, with our kids, our kids will be doing something and I will immediately think of the research and what it tells me to maybe to do in that situation, how to respond to it, or it will give me some perspective like, oh, I get you know, my six-year-old is really upset right now. And I get why, because she's really worried about the rain tomorrow and, and she's freaking out because of that. And he may not see that. And, um, and I know that it doesn't, he, the light does not go off in his head. <laughs> like he, mm -hmm. he's, he's seeing it from a totally different place. Um, and often we'll kind of get through that moment and, and I will know that he's like, why did you do, and I'll handle it a certain way or something. And he's like, why did you do it that way? Why were you, and I will often bring it up later and say, hey, so the reason that I talked to her that way or I said what I said was because I know that there is a bunch of research showing that, you know, in if, if, um, if a kid is really um, focused on one particular thing, then they're not going to be able to see it a different way. I don't remember what the specifics were, mm -hmm. but I will often bring up the research and say, so there have been studies that I've read that suggest this thing, and that's why I'm handling it this way. And I try, it's hard because I don't tell him how to do things. I don't tell him like, you should do it this way next time, because I feel like he's not going to be very receptive to that. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of share it as this is what I've learned that the research is saying, and um, that's why I handle it this way. And I do think that it gets, that he appreciates it on some level. It's probably annoying as hell too. I mean, because <laughs> in any kind of situation, you know, he's like, oh, you're the parenting expert. Uh, um, but in all honesty, I don't have answers to a lot of the questions, but um, it must be difficult for him to be in that situation as a parent, but he takes it well. And I think sometimes he finds it interesting and helpful. And I will see him the next time we're in a situation like that, deal with it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So I try to, I try to educate him without sort of hitting him over the head with, with it, mm -hmm, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and he's actually read my book. He's one of, he was one of my proofreaders or, um, and so he has, has read pretty much everything that I have read now because I put so much of what I learned in my book. Mm -hmm. um, and I have seen since he's read the book that he's also sort of changed some ways of handling situations. Um, he talks more about feelings. He acknowledges and validates feelings much more where he's like, okay, I see that you're really frustrated, you know, and you can be frustrated up in your room, but you can't kick the chair like that. So I will see him trying to acknowledge and, and, um, and validate their feelings a little more which is helpful. That's so awesome. I wanted to ask you, this is the last question. What can you give our listeners? What kind of advice would you share with them? Well, um, I will answer that in the context of where we are right now. Uh, mm -hmm. We're in a difficult spot right now with the pandemic and our, I think we are, many of us are struggling um, mm -hmm. and our kids as well. And one thing that, um, having talked to a lot of child psychologists about how to handle kids right now is to give them just a little more leeway and a little mm -hmm. more control, um, and let go of things a little bit as a parent. Um, so, you know, one person I talked to said that she now doesn't make her kids clean up their room because, she just wants them to have control over their space because it's the only space they have right now. So they can have their room the way they want or, um, you know, or maybe like leaving, not responding as harshly to bad behavior as we might in the past because kids are really struggling more than they usually are. And when, and thinking of it like you know, you give your kids a little leeway when they're sick, you let them get away, you know, they, they can be a little extra grumpy when they're sick and we don't, we don't hold them to the same standards, kind of thinking of it that way. Like think of your kids as, yeah, we're all kind of a little bit sick right now. We're in a situation where we're not at our best and the more sort of grace and, and um, compassion we can give them, mm -hmm. the better off we'll, we will all be, hmm. if that makes sense. No, absolutely. That's such awesome inspiration that you just gave us there. Um, Melinda, 
thank you for coming on our show. I mean, you're the second woman to ever be on this man show. Oh my gosh, you're <laughs> yeah. kidding. That's, yes, oh, yes. wow, I'm very honored. Wow. So it's, 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 it's awesome to get your perspective. And I like doing this because, you know, it's all about perspective. It's all about seeing what our significant other is saying to us. You know what I mean? It's about that communication. So with that being said, can you share with our audience where they can get a hold of you, where they can get your book mm. and stuff like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so my book is available on Amazon, on Bookshop, on all the all the Barnes and Noble. It's called How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes. <laughs> hmm. And um, I have a newsletter, actually, a parenting newsletter that is addressing parents' questions about challenging kid behavior. So why why are kids doing the things that they're doing and what can you do about it? So the last one was, why are kids so difficult at bedtime and what are some strategies for dealing with it? My um, newsletter, actually the best way probably to sign up is just to go to my website, which is melindawennermoyer.com. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a sign up there. And that's just a free, free weekly newsletter where I'm talking to experts and answering questions. Um, and you can contact me through my website too. If you have, you can submit questions for my newsletter too through there. So yeah, that's how to reach me. That's the best way. Well, awesome. Melinda, I thank you so much for coming on here and just sharing your information to us and our, to our audience. And uh, like I said, it, it's been a privilege. I love talking to you <laughs> and everything that you're doing. So, you know, I definitely will be in touch with you and, uh, subscribing to your 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 newsletter and stuff like that as well <laughs> so, awesome well thank you david this was super fun thanks for having me awesome well thank you have a good day you too